Um, my name is James Alexander. Um, I work at the Wikimedia Foundation doing the merchandise, so many of you have seen me at the store. Um, but my interest before I joined as a community member um, and as sort of a random uh, nerd in the industry um, was copyright and uh, intellectual property, um, which is what I'm talking about today. Um, I also trained in college um, in economics, mostly because I find it cool. Um, and, so wanted to, and so that's really the, sort of the basis of where this comes from. Um, and we'll see if this can actually work. Oh, there we go. We're just going to speed through. <laughs> so a quick pop-up on copyright and on economics. Copyright, obviously, most Wikipedians know a fair bit about. Um, in the US, it all comes from the uh, Constitution and then through all the laws afterwards. Um, but with its main purpose to try to progress science and the arts and to try to encourage people to um, develop and, and, and to create new things. Um, and the idea is that if you give them a incentive, if you give them especially a monetary incentive, um, then they will develop more. They'll create more. They'll keep going. Um, on a personal level, I think that works or worked and continues to work in some areas. Um, but obviously, time has sped forward through that. Um, and our copyright and patent rules and laws are now an enormous spectrum, all based on these old ideas, both from the Constitution in the US, but also from the same sort of goal, I think, everywhere else in the world. Um, if you look at patents, um, so the one side of an extra property, you have some things like drug patents, which I would argue tend to do most of what they are meant to do still, um, and have a limited lifespan of only a couple years. People spend an enormous amount of money to develop them, and then they get some of that back. And then, but then it becomes free, because the other main point of that was that to get a patent, you had to publish everything that you essentially needed to make it, um, which then means as soon as it expires, everybody else can make it and develop off of it. Um, and you, so you share that knowledge. Um, on the flip side of that, you have things like software patents, um, which probably many of you have seen, many have expired. They have the same set period in general as drug patents, except that you spend much less money on it, and they are somewhat useless very quickly um, because innovation just keeps going. Um, and so by the time it's actually free to use, there's not a whole lot there. Um, copyright is very different, um, and it's very different all over the world. But the same idea is there, is that you wanted to encourage their innovation, and you also want to encourage growth, and you want to encourage utility. So you want to make sure that there is the art that it's good for everybody. And this is going to happen again. Economics is the study of that utility. So it's the study of finance and what's happening and why people want something. But the way I always try to think about it is sort of why are they going to, why do they want something? What is, um, what are they going to buy? What are they going to want? How is the economy and sort of the global marketplace going to react and why? Um, if you've ever seen economic theory, if you've ever listened to economists, they use an enormous amount of math. They use an enormous amount of equations that have all kinds of things. Um, and then sometimes they forget about the fact that it's really not a natural science. It has lots and lots of math. And lots and lots of smart people will tell you the exact opposite thing. And they're very, very confident. Um, and that's because it is an incredibly social thing. And so you can have incredible geniuses who both think that each other are geniuses and completely disagree in the economics. And that's what has always become a problem. And so I looked, I've been looking at my quotes, and you had the idea that scarcity is economics. The less you have and the more somebody wants it, the higher the price is going to be, the higher somebody is, is willing to get it, if they want it. If they don't want it, they're not going to pay anything for it. And we'll get to that a little bit later. But the politics part is very, very different. 
And so you've all seen with the economic downturn when the, everybody wants to, to increase the economy, they want to increase the market, they want to get more jobs, they want to get more money flowing. Um, but obviously you can't just print money because then you have the same amount of stuff and more money and so they just cost more. It just, it just changes the prices but it doesn't actually change anything else. Um, and people get scared. People have gut reactions. And that's where the math and science of economics goes down the drain and you have to start thinking of the sociology and the psychology of, of economics. Because people will always have a gut reaction that may not actually make sense. And you can sometimes think about it, um, but it, you have to guess and you have to guess and it depends on what they are. And so here in the United States, the military is a big thing, and so people will want it to be want it to be important, and they'll want to and they'll want to fight for it. And sometimes they'll think it's worth more money than it is, but they'll say, "Oh well, we can cut down on say the science or the math." Of course, the science and the math drive the military in the end, and so they're not actually they're not they're not necessarily a balancing act. But people's gut reaction of wanting security or oh this extra education don't necessarily match. And the same thing happens with math and the same, or with writing or with other pieces. Um, but when you're going through, there's always that big question. Um, and so why, why do they want it? And if they don't want it, um, if they do want it, what are they going to pay for it? Which is really a question of how much do they want it. Um, which we do by utility. Um, so here is a graph that we call um, an indifference curve, or an indifference graph. Um, because utility and economics, we consider it a, sort of an idea of their preferences. Um, in finance, it's based on this price, because that's what they're thinking about. Um, mostly because it's the only way that they can think to measure utility. Because how do you measure how much you want something? Um, at some level, you can't really just use price, but it's the closest they get. And so the idea here is you have one good, you have another good. You have good X and good Y. Um, usually when you're actually thinking about it, the idea is you have good X and you don't have good X. At what price do you not care? And that's the indifference price. And so what, so if, if I have an apple and it's for $3, is it worth $3 to me? Is it, or is the $3 worth more to me somewhere else? $3 is probably too much. A dollar is probably fine, I'll spend it, but I'll just keep spending it because it's so cheap. Um, at 250, I could go buy a banana, I'd rather buy, go buy the banana, or I could do the apple, they're really worth the same amount. And so then I just don't care. Um, as soon as you go on either side, I'm now gonna have a change. Um, but the reason you look at this and you see multiple curves is because this indifference decision is completely different. Some people will love apples a whole lot more some people will love uh, uh, bananas a whole lot more, and they'll change that. And some people just don't want, won't, want, won't want to eat much. And so at a dollar, they'll say, well, this dollar is worth more because I want to go buy a song on iTunes. And so that's much better. <laughs> um, and then we get to the idea of the copyright in economics. Um, I'll get to this in a second. <laughs> But so, so it gets there. But the copyright and, for, and sort of all right, theft, um, there's a whole lot of idea of copyright theft or piracy or something like that. Um, but of course, that's all based on the idea that you stole something, that you stole something that was made, that's, a, that's something that is physical. So when you think of theft, you, th you think of the fact that I went there and I took your laptop, and now you don't have it and it was worth $15,000 for you, or it was worth $1,500 for you, or it was worth a dollar to you. It was worth something. Um, or it was just incredibly important to you in some kind of psychological meaning because your father gave it to you. Or, and maybe it wasn't really worth anything. It didn't even turn on. Um, or the parts weren't going to be helpful. But, but it still meant something to you. Um, the issue, of course, now in this day and age is that the fact that I took it from you doesn't necessarily mean you couldn't get it back somewhere else if it's not physical. And so that's where the, idea, the issue of songs and videos and, the, and software and all that comes from. 
is because it's no longer the fact that there's just one left. Um, you, net, you, you don't have a finite amount. And so one song may be worth 99 cents on iTunes, but that same song could be worth about 50 on Amazon, it could be worth zero on Napster, or it could be worth $500 to the RIA. Um, and, and at some level, all of those um, prices are real. They're all true. But which one makes more sense to you depends. So the RIA, that $500 or that $1,000 is how much that song is worth. Because in their opinion, you take it and then you can bring it down, you can, you can go further on, you might be, you'll be listening to it over and over and over and over again and maybe they should be paid for every listen. Um, or just because they want to try to balance it. And so if they charge you $1,000 for, um, for a song, they expect you to share it to another 100 people and so really it's only worth $10 but they were, they're trying to, trying to make sure they get their money's worth. Um, but when you buy it for, from iTunes, it's only yours and you can't, you can't share it and so it's only worth a dollar. Um, but then the real question comes up, what if your indifference price is zero? And that's where the argument falls apart. Because everything else makes sense. If if that song is really, really important to you and you're willing to pay $1,000 for it, then it's worth $1,000. That, that is what its price is to you. And you may get it cheaper, but it's worth $1,000 if you're willing to pay it for it, pay that. Um, and it's worth a dollar if you're willing to pay that. But if you sit there and say, well, I'd like to listen, listen to it, but I don't really need to, then it could be worth zero or if you really don't want to listen to it, it could even go negative. Um, and so the idea of what, how to deal with that is, is a big question. And then you run to the issue that utility isn't just yours. So say you take the song, you buy it from iTunes, or you get it downloaded for free, or you win it in a lawsuit for $1,000. Um, what else are you now doing with that song? So you have this copy. You can technically just keep copying it. You can keep giving it away. You can keep doing that. And you've paid that much money, but now what's happening to that? Maybe you paid zero, but you play it at your band concert. Just with the DJ earlier, and Philippe hears it and loves it. He, he's never heard that band before. It's awesome. Um, he's now paid nothing for it, but he wants to hear more, and so goes on iTunes and buys the CD for $10. You paid zero for it, it was zero, but now it's worth $10 to a multitude of people who are getting cuts from that. Um, and the only reason that happened was because he heard it. And that's where the economic sort of equation screws up, because now it can duplicate. You could give him a copy for free, but if he wants to get more, he could get it from somewhere else, he could, play, he could want to go to their concert and pay, and pay a lot of money there. And all of a sudden, all of that goes out, goes out the window, and you're not sure how much money, how much utility came from that. Because now one digital file is essentially infinite utility for an infinite amount of people. And it's really the same. So you, you can think of that one song as that song everywhere. Um, no matter how many copies they are, it all started from one copy and it kept going around. And it kept having more utility. Um, and at some level, there may be a finite amount of utility because there's a finite amount of people who would care about that. But there's so many people and there's so many people who haven't heard it, heard it that there's essentially not. There's essentially unlimited. Um, because everybody who would want to hear that song would have some reason to want to listen to it is almost never going to be found, even in this day and age. Maybe at some point when anybody can find anything. But even then, there are so many songs that they're never going to hear every one that they would like. Um, and so when you listen to the discussions and the arguments, um, and the SOPA uh, debate was a, a big part of that, you had the idea that piracy itself was, by definition, bad. That it was theft, that it was wrong, and that it cost lots and lots of money. Um, and even a lot of the opponents of SOPA and PAPIPA, of ACTA, and, and all the other ones, use that argument. They're made, like, Wikipedia did not necessarily, Wikimedia did not necessarily, actually in general we didn't, 
Um, but Google certainly did, Facebook certainly did, a lot of other opponents certainly did, and most of the nonprofits who are going against it in other groups will tend to take the charge of, you're right, piracy is bad, this isn't the way to go about it though. Um, the issue is that that's based on the assumption that it's bad. And it's possible that there are places where it is, that there are places where it, where it really is completely taking money away and, then, and taking away that, that desire, that drive to have innovation. Um, but starting from that assumption is just wrong in the very face value. Because you know that it's not necessarily true. You know that taking that song could lead to lots of other people hearing it. Or the fact that you have three terabytes of songs doesn't mean you ever, ever would have wanted that if you couldn't get them for free. You probably would have had far, far, far less if you had to pay for it. And you probably would have been almost as happy. Um, the people who are downloading hundreds of millions of songs aren't listening to them all. And they're certainly not listening to them all frequently. Um, and so the people who are downloading all of those songs aren't really costing anything. But they may be added. Um, and they actually almost certainly are adding something to the general group. They're playing those songs occasionally. They're sharing them with people. Sometimes that person won't pay any, but they frequently will. And all it takes is one or two to go to the band concerts and to go, to the, and, and to go buy the CD. And we all know from studies that that is true. Um, well, if you don't, there, p people, when they, when they look at it, people listen to a song and they will go buy it. Or they will go to the go to the concerts, and they will try to work on it. And so it's possible that the economy has to change. And so maybe the record industries who are spending lots of money trying to increase, um, in increase people's popularity and should be getting a cut from that concert, which they frequently don't, which is very true. Maybe, maybe they should get a cut of that concert. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're not spending an equal amount of money that they would have. Um, the other side of that is, there's, when you have an indifference curve, there's always a trade. If you have $10 and you don't buy a song with it, or you don't buy a CD with it, you don't lose the $10. You're going to spend it on something else. And you're almost always going to spend it on more entertainment. And so if you sit there and you take that $10, you're going to take that $10 and you're either going to buy a CD, or you're going to go to a concert, or you're going to go to a movie. And, that, and, that, and you don't get extra $10. You don't duplicate the $10. And so actually taking that, and if, you, and if you, it, the song or something isn't worth the $10, then spending it on somewhere else makes sense. It makes economic and it makes, util makes sense trying to get the most utility, trying to get the most value out of what limited resources you have. Especially when you can get the song too. But that doesn't mean that song becomes zero. It was worth zero to you and you still got it. Or it was worth less to you and you still got it. But then, if you keep playing it, if you keep listening to it, it does actually increase. And so it's not zero forever. Um, and so that's, my, that's the big question there, is that the assumption that piracy is by default bad because it's theft um, doesn't, doesn't hold true. It doesn't ring true. And so the question that we have to look into, which most people aren't, and I think deserves an enormous amount of study. People starting to get it. There was a New York Times article a couple months ago where somebody was saying, wait, this doesn't make sense. Um, and there's been a couple more, but they had, nobody sort of delved into it where they really wanted to, is to figure out where, where it really does cost and where it doesn't. Because usually there are going to be costs. There are going to be giant multi-scale um, consumer, consumer issues, or, uh, consumer sites that are getting enormous amounts of money that are just trying to pretend to be real, sell it, and not actually giving money to the people who are making it, um, that stuff will exist. But when you're just trading it back and forth, is it really costing? Probably not. Um, because you bought that song and you give it to me, you still have the song. It never, it, you never lost it. It's no longer that kind of theft. Um, which in this day and age is very different. Even, 40, 50 years ago, if you, stole, if you stole books, people had paid for those books. 
And so you may spend, be spending $10, but it costs them a, a couple to sell it. They were actually losing something right there. Um, that's no longer the case. So um, with that, I wanted to open up for any questions. Um, and then we can go on to the next panel. Um, yeah, why don't you do because the, the recordings can't hear it. <laughs> Green light? Oh, hi. Ah, okay, go. great. Um, <clears throat> so I, I'm wondering if you could speak to, um, given, well, I, I don't mean to hate on creative works, even though I'm about to say something that kind of <laughs> sounds like that. Just trust I'm a friend. Um, <laughs> um, given the, the opportunity cost and the barriers to entry of things like science, like pharmaceutical development mm -hmm. um, versus the, the relative ease of the creative um, uh, process of you know, drawing the next Mickey Mouse. Mm -hmm. Do you have any inkling of the genesis of like how um, patent law has remained relatively stable and relatively sane versus mm -hmm. the last you know, 20 years where we've seen, um, I mean, how the hell did, did copyright end up in the absolute mess that it's in today? Yeah. Um, I certainly can't talk everything about it. Mm -hmm. um, from personal sake, I think the biggest thing is that it's not just the creative side. And so, yes, it is relatively less making Mickey Mouse, so it's relatively less doing something, but that also represents an incredibly different thing. And so Mickey Mouse represents all of Disney. And it represents all of the goodwill that they have, and it represents everything. And so there is an enormous drive to, to keep that goodwill. Um, and it's the same thing. And so, I think it's a different thing with some books and music, and, and, that's bec and that's certainly become that. But whenever it's an enormous, enormous, enormous amount of, of cash, and when it's things like, tra especially to things like trademarks and copyrights and uh, um, at some level trade secrets, et cetera, um, they frequently represent more than they actually are. Um, despite, and so my I haven't looked at the books, but my guess is that the value of the, of the Mickey Mouse trademark on the books um, is ridiculously high. Yeah. And so in general, if you don't know, for counting purposes, the, the value of a trademark registration or copyright registration starts at like 10 bucks. It starts at what you paid to put it in, which, which now sometimes you get up to a couple hundred, but it's not much, and then you have to pay the lawyers. But then you keep adding to it on your books on how much you spent to enforce it. Um, and so if you spend a million dollars to protect that trademark, it is now worth a million dollars on your books. And it keeps growing and growing and growing and growing. Um, and, uh, that's, and that's really what happens frequently with trademark and copyright, is that in the, at that level, they're protecting something that's more than just the one thing, um, where in the patent, they're just protecting the patent. Right. Um, and so, and I think there's more, in people's minds, so the gut idea that that drug is really important, that that drug is really useful, and that getting that out eventually to the, pu to the public is really important. Um, and so, but with copyright, they're like, eh, it's another book, or it's another, so like, they see that as a different thing. Um, and so I think there was, that's why the, the impetus came in, because at first there was probably less of a, they didn't think it mattered as much. Like, okay, so you can't republish the book, oh well. They don't see that as they don't. They didn't see that as as big of a loss to society, as not being able to generically produce that drug or, or to build off a, an invent, invention. Um, and if they lost the, those abilities, a whole lot more people are angry than if they lost the ability to republish a book. Um, but there are a lot of people really angry if they lost the ability to publish the book themselves and just get the money. Right. right. Um, there's also less money at the beginning. So like one book, you, you might make a lot at the beginning, but you frequent, most cases, you're just sort of making it long over the long run. And so to actually recoup your time and effort, it may take a long time. Um, which is why I think at the moment we have lots and lots of very different things under very small categories. And so you have the idea of like both, both drug patents and software patents in the same bucket, which doesn't make sense. But you also have book copyrights and music copyrights and video copyrights in the same bucket, which also doesn't make sense. 
Um, because for a small published book, it may make sense for it to be 50 to 60 years. Um, like, or at least there's an argument there because it takes you a long time to actually see your, your money frequently. Um, but, and there's also an argument to make it much less, but even there, I could probably see an argument for 13, 15 years where, to be fair, a movie, you're gonna get all your money very quickly or you're not going to usually. Um, and so maybe, the, maybe there should be lots of levels. Cool, thanks. Cool. Yeah. I, I frequently hear the because nothing physical is taken, it is not theft argument, mm -hmm. um, which I think is legally sound and morally very dubious. And <laughs> perhaps not, perhaps the word theft is wrong, but still mm -hmm. the way society is structured now by taking it for free offline, you are not doing it in the proper way. Mm -hmm. and. I think that even if it's not considered theft, even if you're not losing a physical copy, you are still hurting the individuals who are creating it. So I wanted to um, see if you could address the moral aspects that are left over when we scrap the conventional model of, of copyright and patent. Mm -hmm. Like I'd say you're right, a big part of it is that it, the, the word isn't right. When people think of theft, they think of physical loss. Um, and I think it's different, and that's the biggest thing to remember, is that copying something is different than taking something. Um, part of that is, on an economic level, I see it as totally different and completely, diff completely, completely di um, and it, a different issue. But I think the other thing is that it's, the loss is a very large variable. There are some things that you copying from are going to be a large loss, and there's some things that are really gonna be almost a zero loss. Um, and that's very difficult to quantify. Um, and, and I won't try to pretend I can completely quantify it. Um, and morally, morally I think depends. Morally is a hard answer. I, I'd say in general, it's not morally wrong to copy it if you weren't gonna pay for it. But of course, if you're thinking in that mindset, you're likely to copy it and just convince yourself you weren't gonna pay for it even if you would have. Um, and that's where the moral question becomes very complicated because we're really good at deluding ourselves um, just as human beings. Um, and and there, is certainly a, there are certainly places where economically it is the right thing to do and morally it is not, which is also a completely different question. Economically, I think copying it is frequently not a problem at all. Um, morally, it sometimes is. Anything else? Perfect. Then it's about time to move on anyway. Hi, everybody. My name is Anne Klin, uh, user risker, uh, and I'm chairing the panel today where we're going to talk about the 2012 blackout of the English Wikipedia. Uh, today's panel includes uh, Jeff Brigham, general counsel for the Wikimedia Foundation, Brandon Harris, uh, a team member for Wikimedia. Uh, ben McElwain, who is a longtime editor, goes by the username side. And uh, Keegan Petersell, another longtime editor who goes by the name Keegan. So if you'll welcome our panel, uh, we're going to start off with uh, Jeff uh, talking about uh, some of the legal issues that led to the decision that the community made. What I am going to ask is that. Let us, let us go through and do our presentation and we'll do one big question session at the end because I think we're gonna have a lot of questions about, especially about the issues that uh, Keegan and uh, Ben talk about near the end. Is that okay? Great, <coughs> start. Great, uh, I think we have some non-Wikimedians here. So what I'd like to do is sort of paint what our world was pre-SOPA. In our world, we have editors, we have contributors, we have photographers, and each of them are rights owners. So it's no surprise that they take copyright extremely seriously. Unlike big media, though, they, deci they decide to license their, uh, their content freely for the rest of the world to share. They know copyright extremely well. They're extremely uh, vigilant. They are copyright wiki lawyers. Privacy, excuse me, piracy is completely contrary to their values. 
They work every day to take down copyrighted material, material that is improperly on our site to enforce the rights of legitimate copyright holders. That is the world they work in while they're still trying to advance a mission to share free knowledge globally. Their first passion is not politics. It is writing the best encyclopedia in the world. Now SOPA enters the room. Now there were many different versions of SOPA which raised different concerns and different problems, but basically in a very high level summary. What SOPA did is it gave the Attorney General or rights owners, depending on the version, a right to file a notice of infringement to a site. And once that notice was filed, and in some cases there was judicial intervention, in some cases there were not, depending on the ver of version, a service provider would be required to block a domain name, a payment provider would not be allowed to deliver uh, the payments to the uh, supposedly rogue site, and internet um, advertisers could not hand over their advertisement revenues. Now, so there were many bad laws that were similar to SOPA before SOPA, definitely many bad court decisions, and there'll probably be some after SOPA. So the question is, why were people getting angry? And there are a number of reasons in my mind. I think everyone has their own personal opinion on it. First, there was a perception that big media was paying lots of money to lobbyists to ramrod SOPA through to protect their interests. It was, it, uh, it, we were talking about backroom negotiations. There was no outreach to those who had interest in free expression, much less interest in a uh, open, uh, free license uh, environment. The language from a lawyer's point of view was extremely broad and very sloppy. Um, there were versions that clearly included um, Wikipedia and other versions where the language was ambiguous enough that an adverse rights owner could try to prosecute. The, uh, the uh, measures that were uh, in, uh, included were quite draconian. It was to shut down an entire site even though only part of that site was infringing. The mentality was you were guilty until proven innocent. Many small foreign sites, many of which make up our open knowledge movement, would not be able to afford to defend themselves in very expensive U.S. courts. Laws already existed on the books. Why did we need more? In one version, there was DNS blocking that threatened internet security. It was referred to as the internet death penalty. Service providers, payment processors, and advertisers had immunity, so they were very motivated to do whatever they needed to do uh, because they weren't going to get prosecuted for it, and that would, of course, promote conservative content. The bottom line is it was the last straw it was a threat to free speech and innovation. So with that, SOPA was on a fast track to passage. In May 2011, there were 40 co-sponsors of the Senate version of SOPA PIPA and unanimous approval by the Senate Judiciary Committee. In October, SOPA was introduced in the House Judiciary Committee and a month later, hearings began. There was one witness of six who opposed. The bill was almost guaranteed to pass. Then our community entered the room. Our community is very sophisticated, and they talk about things that directly impact issues like free expression, and SOPA was no exception. The discussions were, in fact, taking place on Wiki, and there was a clear interest. And at one point, Jimmy asked for a quick read, so to speak, of the community, and that was on December 10th. It was clear to us at the foundation that if there was going to be a decision to use any of our assets, our, our banners or a blackout, that that decision was not going to come from the foundation. It was going to come from you, the community. Now the internet industry was also talking. Reddit was a leader in talking about a blackout. Craigslist, Google, many other companies were um, in the press talking about their intentions on how they would actually respond to SOPA including our own sister Wikimedia sites, were also involved in the discussions. And it was becoming clear and clear for a, couple, uh, for a number of reasons that January 18th, if you were going to do anything, we would have to do it on January 18th. What did the foundation do in this at that point? 
Well, they committed resources, Philippe and Maggie, to help start facil facilitating the decision, to help the community to come to a point uh, in order to uh, actually meet the deadline if, in fact, the community wanted to act by January 18th. Uh, the legal department, we were hiring, we hired a government consultant to provide information to the community so it could make its decision in an informed way. There were questions like the status of the bill, the different versions of the bill that needed to be explained, the political atmosphere that we might ne not necessarily be feeling in San Francisco, and what the best timing when to act. I had to worry about making sure the consultant was properly registered under federal law. We had to make sure that as a nonprofit, we were uh, acting consistently with the lobbying restrictions to the point of practical measures like designing timesheets for our employees to keep to make sure that we were under financial thresholds, much to Brandon's chagrin. Um, <laughs> I wrote a blog for the community's information about SOPA. Stephen uh, provided summaries of SOPA, the uh, alternative bill open, and by the way, what's this thing, ACT UP, Stephen told us. So those summaries were provided to the community and uh, we were ready to hear what the community's decision would be. Our only request was we needed five days if you wanted to shut down the site. And from there we go to speaking with Brandon Harris who will tell us about the uh, technical issues that we're involved in. <laughs> yeah, this was something. So I, I actually wanna, wanna speak to um, uh, a little bit of an emotional construct that we at the foundation had um, and and that has regardless of what our personal opinions were about this about like the you know the Italians had blacked out their site um, a couple months prior um, and and uh, uh, you know the atmosphere about that uh, we are staffed by um, a group of people who, who whose life is dedicated to keeping this site up and the operations team especially, uh, and some of the developers had real, it was an emotional thing for us to actually actively work to take the site down. Because uh, <laughs> it was like the exact opposite of everything we, we were trained to do. Um, so uh, what, how, this, how this happened? Um, we had been aware at least in the tech side, that this was going to happen or that might happen. But what, we, what it was going to be, we weren't sure. Um, and coming into uh, Friday before the blackout, um, we uh, had a fairly decent idea that there, were, there was going to be something that was going to be done, but uh, we didn't know what it was. And we began with the assumption that it was going to be what we called a, an interstitial soft blackout. So it was just going to be a black screen that you could read something on and then click through and you get to the content. And that was the extent of it. Um, but as things kept going forward, uh, we, uh, <laughs> the, the tea leaves kept changing direction. And uh, eventually it became a hard blackout, like raw and hard. Um, this created many problems for us. So it, it, starting on, on that Friday, oh, there was a meeting and we had like, what are we gonna be able to do? And, and let's talk about it. And we're like, well, we have to design a screen, right? Uh, we got to do a couple other things. And, and we have to implement that. We have to, we have to build these, these tools. And we have to figure out, like, what do we want it to say? And so we had conversations about, like, let's make it so that you can look up your congressman and send them a phone number, you know, and get that. Well, who's, who, who's, who writes that? <laughs> we, don't, we don't, I mean, nobody, we can't use somebody else's congressman look up. <clears throat> because we'll annihilate them. <clears throat> uh, we, had, uh, we had one, um, I'm not, I'm not going to say who it was, we had one uh, uh, nonprofit who has you know, a fair decent amount of traffic uh, offer to, to, to take our traffic for us. They're like, oh yeah, we can handle your, your SOPA traffic, don't worry about it. And we were like, are you sure? And they're like, yeah, we can do it. We're like, are you, re I mean, because number. And then he was like, let me get back to you. <laughs> And then we didn't we didn't hear back we didn't hear back from him, so like until until like the day before and it was kind of like uh, so no, um, so we uh, we had uh, some uh, you know things that we we we, did, we built into the, to the design. It actually uh, the banner um, actually was the uh, <laughs> it's actually the Jimmy banners. It's uh, central notice, uh, and. Uh, 
we, we wanted to use that because it was easy, it was localizable, we could target it, because we, that was the design decision. We thought it was gonna be United States only at first, so we would have had to geolocate it. Um, we wanted to uh, make sure that we could get it translated easy, a bunch of other things. And uh, so we made these design decisions for the software early on before we even got close to the RFC closing uh, because we had to do this. The train was leaving the station. That banner, I, did, I, I designed that in two hours. Uh, that's all the time I had and before we had to start implementing it. And um, that, by the way, I, I've never been more scared in my entire life than walking out of that meeting on Friday, that, that Friday night, and all of a sudden I had this realization that I was actively going to design something that was going to be on the news before it happened. Like I'd never done that before. That was pretty terrifying. <laughs> um, so then we uh, we 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 worked. Uh, several people, and many of them are in this room, uh, were superheroes, uh, and uh, we I think we worked uh, about 20 hours a day for the next several days. One of which was a holiday, but of course we had to come into the office, so that was fun. Katie, hi, how you doing? Uh, yeah, she's all like, yes, yes. Ryan Lane, uh, right there, he's a superhero when we killed the blog server. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Philippe, yeah, Philippe, Philippe killed the blog server. Uh, that was, uh, we put a blog post up uh, talking about this, and um, it, on average, our blog gets, you know, a, a really good post might get 15 comments, and this one had something like 15,000 within the first 24 hours. Um, we, we did this, we put it together. Uh, we had uh, other things like we wanted to use Identica. Oh, oops, they're blacking out. Um, we wanted to use uh, uh, URL, UR1 as the uh, uh, shortener. No, we, we killed them pretty quickly. Uh, it, and it, it, then we worked. And when the RFC closed and we, we knew exactly what our marching orders were, the tempo increased even faster. We built a little war room, and some of us were in there 24-7, 365. I think that there was a, 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 a point when, when uh, <laughs> Sue was coming to the office at like 5 a.m. just as he was leaving, just because we needed to have people there at, at, at all times. Um, did I get that? I mean, that, that happened, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think actually there were many hours that Sue and I overlapped too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was a lot of overlap. Uh, we were working on the messaging for, uh, and I say we, it, it's, it was Jeff and, and Sue were working on the messaging for uh, all the way up until the launch. Um, and uh, then one moment it was there and one moment it wasn't. I was uh, actually plugged into the projector and in the room and I flipped over to my Twitter stream where I was sort of following the stop SOPA thing or Wikipedia blackout tag and it started going too fast to read and it was just this moment where we like succeeded and we like flipped on the black screen and we were like <gasps> woo and then oh man what have we done <laughs> And then I had a day off. No, I, no, I'm kidding. No, we do, no days off. Uh, that's, that's really. Yeah, if I could just say on, on the messaging part, I, I think um, Sue. I'm sorry. We'll catch it. It's okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I wound up chairing this panel today because I was one of the uh, three administrators who uh, closed the RFC. Uh, for those of you who are, aren't on English Wikipedia and aren't familiar with that acronym, that means a request for comment. And as most Wikipedia, English Wikipedia editors know, requests for comments normally last weeks to months, uh, get closed, somebody takes another weeks to months to close them, and eventually, you know, six months later, we have some kind of a decision about something quite often unimportant. Um, this RFC was started on, I believe, a Friday. We closed it on Monday. It was open for 76 hours. 
Uh, it was the shortest RFC that's ever been held on English Wikipedia. It also had almost 1,900 contributors to it, uh, which was the most extensive RFC. So it's hard to say that uh, we weren't getting a good feedback in that 72, 76 hours. Uh, but it did put an awful lot of stress on the, the three of us who were closing. And that was myself, uh, a U United States uh, student by the name of Nuclear Warfare, and another administrator by the name of Andrew Billinghurst from Australia. So you'll notice that two out of three of us are not American. And so we were not going to be personally affected by this legislation. And none of us had particularly had an opinion about it. So we didn't come into the closure with any specific thoughts. But what we did have to do was start reading way in advance. Uh, I think we all started reading it at, at least 36 hours before we started to close this particular discussion. It was readily apparent that one of the issues that had started uh, was uh, there was a big change when we brought the banner advising people about the uh, RFC from US only to all of the uh, Wikipedias. So once everybody had the chance to find this RFC and participate, we saw huge changes in the patterns of the opinions that were being expressed. Uh, when we mainly had American editors uh, participating, it was a much softer sensation, and that was where the foundation was getting their sense that we would probably have some kind of a US-only blackout. As soon as the international English Wikipedia community really got involved, things changed drastically. Uh, and in the 36 hours after they started to really take, take hold, we could see a swing from about 20% global block to almost 60%. So that was, a, that was a huge change in the voting patterns. One of the more important issues was that we had to close this very fast, so we were literally closing it as people were giving their opinions. 72 hours isn't a very long time, so we had to do some extrapolation. And ultimately what we decided, it was clear at least 12 hours before the RFC closed that this was going to be a blackout of some kind or another. But I'm not convinced that the foundation actually understood us when we were trying to get that message to them. <laughs> You're going to have a blackout plan for that. They really didn't seem to quite be getting that. Um, also unusual uh, in the case of closures for RFCs, we actually had some direct communication directly with the foundation about what they were going to physically be able to do, what their limitations would be. So we had to keep that in mind. Uh, because there was no point in our closing it one way and the foundation physically wasn't able to to meet those requirements. So we tried to build in some loopholes into uh, uh, the closure, you know, allowing emergency access uh, to the best of their abilities. Here's your time frames, but if you can't make them exactly. And they seem to do okay, on the whole, I would say. Uh, <laughs> but of course, we then had 24 hours of dead silence on the site, and then another but there was lots of talking going on elsewhere. And I think right now what I'm going to do is turn this over to, uh, to Keegan and, and Ben to talk about some of the pros and cons that were discussed by the community before, during, and after. And go for it, guys. All right. Um, hey, Ben here. I guess I'll be starting off by presenting the For the Black Outside. As you can tell by my clothing, I'm blacked out right now. So. All right. <laughs> um, all right so... Uh, first, I'd like to emphasize that uh, I definitely would not support something like a blackout for most circumstances. It's really only very specific things that are essentially existential threats for Wikipedia. You know, we are a nonprofit. We are an encyclopedia. We have a wide, you know, diverse array of opinions on most issues. But for something that would effectively make, you know, the existence of Wikipedia impossible going forward, I think that's pretty much the only one circumstance where we actually should use our what turns out to be very substantial power to help preserve ourselves. And I would argue that this was definitely pretty much the one and only case we've seen thus far, which actually was a situation like that. 
Um, so for those who aren't familiar with how the request for comment was structured, there was basically a bunch of different sections. Each one was proposing a specific measure, and there were for and against uh, votes, essentially, even though technically it's not supposed to be a vote. It's a consensus-seeking process. Um, so just uh, some quick numbers. Uh, at the time uh, when it was closed, the uh, numbers in favor of the U.S.-only blackout by a geolocation was 479 people in favor. Uh, in terms of a uh, blackout for um, you know, ev English Wikipedia everywhere, 591 people. In terms of blocking out Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedia period across all languages was 763, which obviously wasn't going to happen because the people from those other Wikipedias weren't voting on the English one. And the maximum of proposals for any individual section was just around 100. So in some cases, you had like a more than six to one ratio of people who were in favor of this versus people who were opposed to it. So just in terms of the raw statistics of you know, why this happened, you know, if you were running a US presidential election, that would be a landslide by any measure. Um, and so some of the reasons that I think uh, it was worth stopping SOPA and PIPA and why the blackout was an appropriate response, uh, one of the major problems was it was effectively an end to the safe harbor provisions, which is, uh, as many of you know, is kind of the way that we survive is we aren't you know, explicitly liable for things that our users put on our servers unless we are notified of them and we fail to address them. Uh, if we don't have those protections anymore, we're pretty much screwed and every site out there that accepts general uh, user, sorry, didn't realize I was that quiet. Any s site out there that doesn't accept, uh, that accepts user content would have been screwed in the same way. Um, and then another issue is how it erects national barriers on the internet. There was uh, essentially one of the later versions had two, uh, you know, it, it uh, had two zones that treated domestic sites differently than foreign sites. And, you know, that would be, f you know, fine for us because most of our servers are here, but a lot of the things we link to are on international servers, so we would still be, you know, very vulnerable to things being shut down in, on external links, external references. And also, not all of our servers are in the U.S. And going forward, that may be increasing, you know, that may not necessarily be the direction where the new server farms are being brought up. So, you know, even if it didn't affect us horribly now, it would in the future. And then another big issue is uh, SOPA allows you to cut off payment processors for, like, donations. Uh, you know, they could say we're some pirate site and, oh, now Visa and MasterCard, you can't give money to them. And, um, you know, we kind of need money to keep our servers running. Kind of important. Um, and then also another important thing is just to have solidarity with our friends. Like Google supported us a lot. Obviously this convention supports uh, sort of the free knowledge thing. Free Software Foundation, a lot of your likewise, you know, minded organizations out there were all in favor of this and I think it was important that we kind of showed support for them too. So let's see. And then uh, and I, I like to use the advantage of hindsight here and just say, you know, obviously we couldn't use this at the time, but in hindsight, with 2020 hindsight, you know, it was a good idea. It worked. We didn't suffer a horrible backlash for it. We got the bills crushed. So, you know, it's kind of cheating to say at the end of things that, you know, it was a good idea because it worked, but hey, it was a good idea because it worked. And um, <laughs> final, uh, final point I'd like to make before I turn it over to Keegan for the uh, opposition side is that big corporations have big money. They have lots of money. There are individual donors to certain campaigns who shall remain nameless that are getting, you know, giving tens of millions of dollars, and that's like one person. And then big corporations, too, uh, just it's, it's obscene amounts of money. Then due to a recent unfortunate Supreme Court decision, co corporations' money is their voice. Uh, and we individual, you know, private citizens who are volunteers to uh, just random websites like Wikipedia don't have a voice like that. So the one tool we could possibly use to fight back against them was Wikipedia, the collection, you know, the fifth largest site on the internet that everybody uses to learn all sorts of cool things. So the corporations have their big money, that's their voice, and Wikipedia is ours. Thank you. See if, yeah, okay, this is close enough. All right, um, yes, so I didn't then and uh, still don't really support the concept of blacking out like we did for SOPA. Um, I don't expect to change any minds, but we can still be friends. It's cool. Um, as far as it goes, the various reasons why people opposed, uh, they're the natural reasons. Um, people just wanted to keep editing. They had articles they were planning on working on, stuff that they wanted to do. You know, it's your hobby, and that goes away for a day, so we have to go outside. Um, so, <laughs> and, and the national barriers, um, the English Wikipedia does not represent the United States. 
Um, and so if we wanted to do something, I mean, I didn't mind the ideas if they did a click through that was the United States only, that sort of thing. It's a minor inconvenience and everything. But um, when we take it to the global level where we block out everything for everyone, um, what we've done is in a way, it's kind of a slippery slope argument that we're bringing to the other countries with our warning. Like if we don't stop this here, it's gonna happen to you next. Um, and that's never a guarantee. That's never something that we can do. Uh, I, don't, I don't like that rhetoric. I don't like using it. But that's how it comes across when we do it globally. Because we have people that aren't contributors around the world that are using the English Wikipedia that have no idea this conversation's taking place and they don't care. They're just trying to look up and find something. Um, and, and we take that resource away from them. And it, it's, it's, we're doing a disservice to the global audience to take that resource away. Um, another problem that other people had that I'm kind of indifferent to, but just to express their voice, was that the process happened so fast. As mentioned, we will talk forever um, about trying to get stuff done. But I think for the most part that serves a purpose, just like the reason it takes Congress a long time generally to get something done, but SOPA was fast-tracked, um, is that you talk for a long time to either come to a conclusion or realize you're just kind of talking because that's what you're here to do. Um, and then nothing gets done. But either way, it, it, it takes a long time to come to a correct decision. And we love to get philosophical um, in trying to make our decisions, and you don't really have time to do that in 72 hours, uh, to have those great debates about what we're doing and, and bringing that up. Um, so for me, in my personal opinion, it kind of ties into that, uh, the idea of, uh, as James mentioned in his presentation, that copyright is monetizing knowledge. Um, we have here, as... Uh, and this is just speaking generally for the U.S., we have our, our freedoms. We, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, the right to bear arms, but those aren't really freedoms. Uh, we call them freedoms, but they are regulated. You know, you have to have a permit to assemble. Uh, you have to have permits to carry guns. You, there's, there's processes, there's laws around them. Um, knowledge is something that, to me, it, 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 it's not in the legal realm. It's not in politics. It's, it's not in just the interaction with people because knowledge is universal. Uh, you know, other animals teach their young. Um, other things learn. Other things observe and learn from uh, other things. That's just how it goes. And um, when we take the knowledge and we bring this into the realm of money um, and caring about the big business and caring about what laws people pass and everything like that, that's when we, mo we monetize what we write and what we contribute. And none of us create articles and create content for the money. Uh, the Wikimedia Foundation doesn't raise money to pay an editorial board. Um, none of this is supposed to be about the money. So when we bring it down to the money level, uh, what we've done is uh, we Atlas shrugged um, on the day that we blacked out. Uh, we were upset with wanting to be regulated and wanting to join and do all that. Um, so we took our ball and we went home. And I don't, I don't think that's an appropriate way for us to react because I don't think that it, it, it's kind of the philosophy doesn't make sense. If we're promoting freedom and free content, free knowledge all the time, everywhere, for everyone to look up, um, then why would we take that away? There are better ways to educate people and, and doing all that without restricting the content, without making it go away. Um, I don't think that most of the people that use Wikipedia just to read, which is most you know, 99.9% .9 of the people that our page views come from. Um, I'm not sure that we really got them to pay attention. Uh, we may have gotten Congress to pay attention that it's bad for them for, for now, and SOPA will come back in other bills. Uh, it, it will rear its ugly head again. And what are we gonna do then? Um, have we done our part to inform the people um, rather than just try to scare off Congress? Because if we try to fight big money, we're gonna lose because we don't care about it. So. That was my opinion on it, so. Are there questions from the floor? Are there ever questions? <laughs> <laughs> Make sure the, those mics are on before you start talking. I've been saving this one. And um, all of the questions are for Brandon. <laughs> well, this one actually is for Risker. Um, my, my observation um, of the process was we had a discussion for, for a while. We had a discussion for a while. It kind of was relatively even. Then all of a sudden the news picked up something that Jimbo said and we just got a flood of people in. And when I looked at those people, yes, there were a lot of people from, from other projects. Yes, there were a lot of people who only had three or four edits back in 2007. But 
a solid statistically significant number of the people there were people who had never edited the, um, the project before. And, and there are arguments to be said that we need to include our readers as part of the community, but there are also arguments to be said that we labeled the, the outcome wrong then because we were saying our editing community wants to do this. And so I wanted to know how you accounted for looking at when you were closing the decision, how you accounted for the people that really weren't part of our active community before the discussion and won't, were not part of the community after the discussion ended. Thanks, Finn. Actually, that's a, a very important point, and it's, I, I appreciate you bringing it up. Uh, I would throw this out to you. How do you define the community? It's not just the people who edit Wikipedia, and it's not just the people who edit Wikipedia with usernames who have been here forever. It includes the people who have a username that they've created you know, two years ago because they want to keep a watch list and they come in and they read every day. It includes the IP editors, of which we have thousands and thousands and thousands. It includes our readers. These are all people who are part of our community and we can't ignore them and we can't disenfranchise them. We can do it in certain circumstances, but it's very hard to justify disenfranchising them in a discussion of this nature. But what puzzled me no, about that? No, 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 you've had your question. Oh. Now we've got to go to this side. Sorry, Sven. <laughs> Uh, this is a question reaction to something Side said about we killed SOPA. Um, w was, this, was this Wikipedia defeating SOPA or was this more the coalition of organizations that was opposing SOPA that, that actually defeated it? And I, I'd, yeah. I'd like to open this up to the whole panel. And to be clear, I don't have any quarrel with what yeah. Side is saying. I'm just not as aware of the situation enough to know. Yeah. So Thank when you. I said we killed SOPA, um, I, I obviously am involved in Wikipedia, but I'm also uh, involved in a lot of these other things that also had blackouts and, you know, also are free software projects and everything. So when I said we, I'm kind of referring to exactly that whole coalition, the whole community of which I'm involved in uh, multiple facets. Um, and, and Wikipedia, I think, was the single largest uh, part of it that had the most impact because you know, you shut down Reddit and, you know, it was important. It helped Redditors feel like they were doing something important. Uh, but Reddit does not have the impact, the general cultural impact that Wikipedia does. Like, Reddit did not make, you know, the headline news that night when it went down. Um, Wikipedia, because everybody unavoidably reads it every day because it comes up for every Google search, did have that impact. And that's why I say it was the most important part. We, uh, we also kind of melted the phone lines and, and nobody else did that. So, I mean, that's like, it seems like a stupid thing to say, but we actually had like some thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people call their senators, which uh, has an effect, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I would say that Wikipedia, by far more than any of the other websites processing, had to do with it. Um, just from, as mentioned, from our ability to link to how to contact your representative, um, that's effect on the representatives tied in with the fact that um, if you have ever worked in the realm of their political orders, members of the uh, United States Congress take their Wikipedia articles very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> if any place on Wikipedia is serious business, it is their articles and, and they have aides that are our tax money pays their aides to watch their Wikipedia articles. Like this actually happens. So um, that, that played a big role in that too. So approximately 115,000 websites participated in different ways, but Wikipedia was one of the few that took the bold action of actually blacking out. Uh, we show that 8 million people went to our congressional lookup page, uh, and the word that we hear from Washington is uh, they take very seriously Wikipedia now. Uh, and I think, I think it's fair to say that we were a leader. Um, I, I've lived in D.C. all my life, and um, now that I work for, uh, work for the government, I've, I've been really disappointed in myself of how much politics affects my life, for better or for worse. And uh, so I'm not, I'm not a policy person at all. I just kind of read the news and kind of understand what's going on. And so when, um, when SOPA eventually got defeated and, and it was eventually killed on, on the floor, I, I don't know what the political technical terms. I know one of the concerns that I had, and maybe this is just because I've, I've become so jaded with this whole process, is 
that the, the fear now is that there, there's going to be some bill that's going to sneak language in that's going to basically do SOPA, but it's going to be under the Give Everybody Flowers Act or, or something along those lines. And I know one of the more realistic ones that I, I've heard around, just even in my own uh, you know, friends uh, you know, that are in, in government, is that uh, a lot of countries that don't have the same political ca capital that the United States does will pass SOPA-like laws and then through treaties will basically force the United States to engage in a SOPA-like treaty and basically not have a political discussion and basically the president signs the treaty, sends it to Senate to be approved and, and that's the end of it. And again, I'm not a political scientist so I could be wrong in that process, but that's my understanding. I just wanted to hear from uh, the general counsel specifically but even the panel as a whole as to their thoughts on how Wikipedia would react to that kind of thing and please tell me that I'm crazy that this may not be true. Okay, I'm not willing to certify that you're insane. Uh, <laughs> uh, SOPA, <laughs> SOPA is like a roach in the kitchen. You can st uh, stamp on it and kill it, but they'll be, it'll be back. And uh, that's actually happening. We've seen with ACTA there's been uh, activity uh, post-SOPA led to European protests. ACTA is in a less strong position, but it's still there, not yet ratified, but it's being signed by countries as we speak. Um, in addition, uh, I believe there is actually uh, proposed legislation which looks a little bit like SOPA. We're looking into that. Uh, politicians will be back uh, in the kitchen, and uh, uh, and they will continue putting forward an agenda that they believe in. I think for us as a movement, uh, my personal reflection, and this is only personal, is what does that mean? Uh, the questions I have about SOPA are, it's fine to black out, but what is the post-SOPA strategy if you're going to have legislative impact? And I leave that question open for the, uh, for the community. Stuart? Um, so before I ask my question, I just want to say, as someone who only spent about 30 minutes participating in the RFC, thank you for all the work that you guys put into that. I think it's really amazing. Um, and then I wanted to ask about the 76 hour RFC and like the idea of that, not for, and if you think that that's something that, I mean, it amazed me that that decision got made so quickly. And I wanna ask not just about kind of future political, like are we gonna black out again, but what do you think about the idea of having, you know, the 76 hour RFC for, RFC for like wiki things and if that was, or if that was something that you would never want to do ever again? Uh, speaking as one of the closures, I would say there are so few situations that I can imagine where that, that would be appropriate. When we're talking about a policy, we really need to talk about a policy. We need to wordsmith it. And this was basically an on-off question, uh, or which parts will we switch off or which will we sleeve on? And something that isn't often mentioned is the fact that this discussion actually had been going on for about a month and a half. It had started on Jimmy's page. It had been in various other areas on the wiki. It just wasn't coalesced in one place. Uh, the earliest things I found were in November. So when, when we were looking back and, and uh, considering our position, I will tell you I, that was a heck of a job to do, to read you know, almost 1,900 opinions in a very short period of time, and to really pick out which ones were opinions and which ones were you know, were they this opinion or that opinion, especially because there are all kinds of different headers in the middle of the page, and it was a tremendously badly organized RFC. <laughs> uh, but I can't complain because it was what it was. And ultimately, the foundation needed to have an answer, so we gave them an answer. It could just as easily have been, forget it, guys. We didn't know when it started, definitely. I, I just want to comment about it from the point of view of another language, Wikipedia, and, and yes. say something. Um, I learned about the blackout the day before at 6 o'clock in the evening when I got uh, noticed English is going to close tomorrow. Can you translate it to, an, to, to Hebrew and tell us what, it's, what they are talking about? <laughs> so I, I saw your, your, your blog actually explaining what is SOPA is. I translated and I had to check, does it affect actually legislation in another country? Would it affect us? I called professors. Uh, wanted to know if it has any real effect on Wikipedia. Can we continue to work even if it exists because we are outside? And then you make a choice because uh, Professor Shazafer Fahri from Haifa University said it's serious, it's really important, it's going to close down Google, it's going to close down Yahoo, it probably will stop Wikipedia, but 
if the internet will survive, everybody is just going to move to Europe and work from there. <laughs> it, the US will close down, there will be no internet, but we can continue elsewhere. So it's basically was to choice how, how to phrase it, how to, to put the sound right in. And eventually when I translated it to Hebrew, it, it was my choice. I said, they are closing down the internet. That's the way we phrase it. And of course it went on the news the next day in Israel and made a big noise. And the Israeli community only heard about it the next day in the media. I think that even though you had a very short time, you had three days in advance, it's enough for small communities to make a decision and actually be informed and actually vote about it. And I be, I'm not sure, most, you need to understand this, we are not using English Wikipedia as a reference, but we are using it as a source. We, most articles in smaller Wikipedias are translated from English. 80% usually, the statistics. So you close it for one day, you cannot translate. You cannot write any new articles except about your own subjects. And it's, it's, a, it's a big chunk. And people, people are really technical. They can work around the blackout. There was even a discussion, should we do a workaround to continue working? And we decided, no, we're going to respect the English community and just leave it for a day and not write any translated articles that day. But I think you should have gone back to the other communities in their language a few days, two days, three days before, and got votes. And maybe many other Wikipedias would have joined the blackout, agreed to do it. And in other Wikipedias, it's usually not consensus-based, but votes, you just get the 100 people who are allowed to vote to vote, and you get a really quick answer. It's an interesting point of view. Yeah. Ryan? So um, I'm one of the operations engineers that brought down the site. So I, the I did, I pulled the trigger. So, um, <laughs> so, so obviously I was pro blackout, but I did still have these feelings that were kind of, I'm trying to keep the site up and I'm bringing it down. But I would like to respond to um, uh, the, the statement that this is a US only problem. It's really not a US only problem. The internet is a global thing. And um, politics are a global thing. Our servers that actually host our content are only hosted in the United States. And there's very few places in the world that we can host our content because of the laws in the countries. So if, for some reason, this law was passed in the United States, yes, we can move our servers. It's a possibility. It takes a very long time to do so. We've been bringing up a new data center in the United States for the past nine months. If we were to have to move our servers to another country, it would probably take us a year. We would, we would have a possibility of being down for an entire year. And that's just to bring it to another country. And then even then, what happens when these other countries start passing similar laws? So the fact that this is um, a US only problem is not really true. It's a global problem. So <clears throat> the fact that we, glo we blacked out globally is a good thing. We're bringing this information to everyone that it's not just the US that's being threatened, it's the entire world that's being threatened. So um, do you think that um, in this situation where we have this problem of not being able to host our servers in, uh, in many places in the world, do you still feel that it is just a US only problem or do you think that it may be a global problem? Oh, me? Yeah. Um, no, um, I, I never meant, uh, sorry if it came across me saying that was a U.S. only, implying that was a U.S. only problem. It's definitely a global problem. Um, uh, just, uh, we're speaking just on the terms of the U.S. blackout, but it's definitely a global problem, as the Italians protested before, um, as the Russians just protested. Just did, yeah. yeah, they just did. Um, but like with the experience with the Russian Wikipedia, um, number one, the law passed, um, as it currently stands. Uh, they're still debating, things are going and everything like that, but it's gone through reading, and I believe it just has to be signed. So uh, they lost, um, so after blacking out their website. So at what point, when SOPA comes back, which it will in some other form, at what point when, when we keep blacking out do we start to lose that power to, to, or lose that edge? Um, and that was getting more to my point of using, the, using it as an educational opportunity and the, okay, we did this, now what are we doing after SOPA? Uh, because in, in educating the world that it, yes, it is a global problem, um, because each nation is a t is a, you know increasingly trying to nationalize their internet, um, but at the same time we have internal politics with ours and nationalizing the internet and when we do it, um, for example, uh, there's a heated thing going on with the Russian Wikipedia from what I understand, um, just because I don't speak Russian, so we're just following mailing lists and people keeping us informed of translations. Um, now that they blacked out, uh, the people that do not live in Russia are 
upset that their views were not represented in blacking out. Um, the Russian Wikipedia blacked out because of what was going on in Russia, and the people, the Kazakhs, uh, Belarus, all the neighboring places where people primarily speak Russia, they took serious issue with them using the Russian Wikipedia for their national issue. So it's a global problem politically, and it's a big internal problem for us politically, and we just have to figure out where to go. But yeah, no, it's, it's definitely not good, uh, internet censorship or control or trying to, th the silly notion that governments have to think that ultimately they can control the internet, because I don't believe theoretically in the long term that they can. Um, but they can certainly make our lives difficult, as they do in many countries around the world right now as we're talking. So, yeah, I think we all know those places. So, uh, We have time for one more question. Uh, and for any women in the room, the Wiki Women's Lunch has started, so if you might want to slip up there. Uh, and So some here. years ago, I wrote a book on how old media used their media assets to pursue their information policy agendas. And one anecdote that might interest you, in 1990, when the TV broadcast industry was interested in preserving what they called free culture and free TV, which they, by that they meant ad-supported TV. And they got uh, Walter Cronkite, the most respected newsman in the world, to do a 30-second ad on the need to preserve free TV. And they had what they called a roadblock, not a blackout. And, and it was done during prime time. And for 30 seconds, every broadcast a TV channel in the United States had Walter Cronkite saying, if you didn't pass this particular bill, which would give the broadcasting industry must carry on cable, uh, 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 preferred positioning, and retransmission consents rights on cable, um, the whole broadcast industry and the whole tradition of free TV and culture uh, would go down. Now, there's a cautionary tale here. Uh, you're newbies in the area of using your media assets to pursue information policy agenda. The person who led that campaign was Milt Maltz, who had a network of UHF TVs. Now, when that law passed, the value of his network increased by hundreds of millions of dollars. He later sold out for about a billion dollars. In DC, he runs the International Spy Museum as a charitable sort of enterprise. But anyway, uh, there were real economic interests. I'm not sure if in the end that bill encouraged uh, free TV or free culture. In fact, I might argue the opposite. But there's a lot of this. If you read about Rupert Murdoch, for example, there are many books and articles about how he has used his media assets to pursue information policy, things that, so I think you probably have many more assets that you actually recognize, and you've just sort of tipped the iceberg, but it's a cautionary tale, too, that you have far more latent power than you may recognize, but you need to, you know, use it uh, cautiously, because you're a nonprofit, these were for-profit companies, but it's just a cautionary tale I, I hope you'll consider. Yeah. Um, you know, when you started the conversation here, you talked about how Wikipedia does respect copyright. And I've heard several times that SOPA is coming back. In fact, the Pro IP Act would allow, uh, you know, enforcement efforts to do what they did uh, in SOPA right now. So my question is this. I don't vilify the copyright industry or the trademark industry, and I want to know what you guys are planning to do to work with them to get some enforcement efforts that will work for both of you. That, that actually seems kind of out of scope for the, the, for the thing, because it's not what we're going to do, it's what we're going to do. So yeah, That's an on-wiki conversation. That's an on-wiki conversation. Start an RFC. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it was just like, yeah, 72 hours. <laughs> Oh, but seriously, that's, that's an on-wiki conversation that we can more than happy to have. We should be having it, yeah. yes. That we should be. Yeah. Can, I, can I just make one point on the topic that uh, you wanted me to defer on? Is uh, One of the challenges we had was once it was decided that uh, the community had made its decision was how do we keep the community involved in the loop? And messaging was one example of that. Uh, so I think uh, Sue and the staff did a great job at drafting. But we also put in mechanisms to loop back to the community. And if anything like this happens in any other context, I think we have to keep the community involved um, through the entire process. Thanks. Thank you.